Well, thank you, Edward. And thank you so much to Lily and Chastin for being here. It's so great to have you on. Uh, Lily, I want to start with you. Uh, the NEA has come out with uh, recommendations with principles for reopening schools. And I wonder if you could just tell us a little bit about what people should be thinking about, what leaders should be thinking about uh, as they plan to potentially reopen their schools. We have some guidance that is basically uh, right out of the Centers for Disease Control. I am an excellent, really good sixth grade teacher. You would want your kid in my class. Um, I am not an infectious disease uh, medical expert. And so we rely on those folks to tell school boards, educators, parents, governors, presidents of the United States, for instance, uh, that this is what is necessary to do this safely. And basically the number one thing, and it's the thing that people keep forgetting, you should have a consistent at least two week decline in the infection rate till you have the community's infection rate under control. It doesn't mean zero, but it means that you see that what you're doing is making a difference. And so all of these folks that go, open up the doors, all the kids back in, you know, rush them, put them all in there. Uh, we, we are uh, more than appalled. We are completely frightened that there are a lot of politicians who don't know what a sixth grade teacher knows about infectious disease control. When you get to that point, and by the way, there are places in the United States, there are small communities, there are uh, counties in the rural uh, um, um, countryside that say, yeah, that we can check that box. All right, but you're not finished yet. Now you do the rest of your homework. How are you gonna distance your kids? Uh, they have more regulations about how to open a restaurant than how to open um, a public school safely. And so they say distance, 50% capacity or 60% capacity. In my class, when I had 39, 12-year-olds in that class, that was going to be a challenge, right? But extra space, uh, plastic, uh, what do you call it, plexiglass shields, uh, kids on split shifts, a lot of creative people trying to figure this out, that this would be the bridge to a time when it gets better and better and better. Um, we need the stuff. We need the disinfectants, the hand sanitizers. We need the protective gear, uh, the masks or the face shields. Um, and by the way, and this is not a small thing, you need to have health screenings, if not every day, several times a day. I mean, it, you're supposed to know uh, who might be at risk of having it and passing it on to the folks that are there. So we are more than alarmed that there's a, a governor in Florida, a president in the Oval Office, who basically didn't seem to have done his homework. And it's like, open up the schools, all the kids, pack them in there. Um, kind of a cavalier, don't worry, those kids can't get sick. Yeah. They can, if you have asthma, you can die. And by the way, not a word about the teachers getting sick, the lunch lady getting sick, the school custodian getting sick. And I've had more than one teacher who called me and said, are we being punished? Are we being punished by Betsy DeVos and Donald Trump because we've not been very supportive of them? Are they saying, and yeah, a lot, a lot of those teachers will die and I tell them I don't know what's in someone's mind, but I will tell you the questions are there and I don't have good answers. Chastin, you worked as a teacher up until your husband's presidential run. Uh, I wanna ask you about something you tweeted recently. You wrote, it is painful to see districts and lawmakers sit comfortably with the fact that we are about to send our teachers and students into a house fire with a garden hose. Can you tell us a little bit more what you, about what you meant by that? Uh, and also, what do you think should be done? Yeah, I think I should change my analogy, though, because it, it doesn't feel like we're sending kids into a house fire with a garden hose. It feels like in many places we're sending teachers and students into a house fire with a squirt gun. I mean, in many places, uh, teachers are wondering, terrified, um, distraught about what they are going to do when we open those doors. Now, I understand that there won't be a perfect right answer to how we, we deal with going back to school, but there are many, many wrong answers and many, many ways we can approach this that will be detrimental to the health of teachers 
and students and families. I, I follow a lot of teachers. I, I met with hundreds, if not thousands of teachers out on the campaign trail and I'm having daily conversations with other teachers who are terrified about going back to school. I'm worried about how, like Lily said, we make sure that teachers are uh, equipped with proper PPE. Just, I think that's, that's the, the ground floor, is just making sure that teachers and staff have the materials necessary to be able to do their job in a safe way. And if doctors and nurses can't get enough PPE, how are we going to make sure that teachers and staff are getting them? And I also think that to, to this president and to this secretary of education, School is just childcare. It is a way to get the economy back on track, open up the doors so you have a place to put your kids so you can go back to work. And, and education school is not just childcare. There are many other things that need to take place in order to have a proper educational environment. But I think this president and the secretary of education are simply viewing this as another way to ask teachers to take one for the team. Back in March, we were saying teachers are heroes. Many people, many parents were saying, teachers are heroes, they're so fantastic. I, I can't imagine ever doing this full time when they had to homeschool their kids for a few months. And now many of those same people are saying, okay, get back in there, right? Like, like Lily was alluding to, it's sort of like a, a trash can was on fire in the school in the spring. We said, okay, get everybody out, get everyone out of the building. Now the building is on fire and we're saying, well, gotta get back in there. We gotta do it for the economy. And I want to see the government take very specific steps on how to inform states and local school districts on how they can do this safely. And I think that starts, like I mentioned, with the ground floor, ensuring that every teacher, every staff member, every child has the proper PPE to even go back to school. And we haven't even, we haven't even graced the surface of mentioning what many school districts are doing, which is digital and e-learning, where in many areas uh, there, there's a lack of Wi-Fi and also a lack of computer literacy. You can't just put a Chromebook in the lap of a third grader and expect them to log on to Google Classrooms and know what they're doing. I mean, in many ways, I hear districts talking about K through two students getting Chromebooks, and that is supposed to suffice. Driving to a community parking lot, accessing Wi-Fi at an access point, and then expecting that third grader to open up Google Docs and upload their daily work. I mean, we are not checking a lot of boxes here on how to actually think about ways in which we're going to make sure kids are in an appropriate, supportive, educational work environment. Chastin, you, you, you said it beautifully. Um, this administration, the Trump administration and a teacher, are trying to solve two different problems. And it's why what we're saying doesn't make any sense to Betsy DeVos. They are saying, uh, as they talk to business CEOs, uh, who said, wow, I want my, my people back and they've got these rugrats in their homes, you know, and, and they're driving them crazy. Get those kids back out of school. So Donald Trump is, uh, is uh, focused on, okay, I got to get those kids out of the house, but warehouse them somewhere. And so when we say we're educators, we care about their academic needs, we care about their social emotional needs, and we care about their health and safety. And we don't trade one off for the other. We're looking for a plan that deals with the whole child. And so we're talking about social distancing, of, of uh, hybrid, virtual, we're talking about maybe in shifts or every other day. And he's looking at us like, what are you talking about? Get the kids out of the house, put them back in the room. That, what are you talking about? Hybrid plans and, and maybe they aren't going to be in school all day long because he's not talking about kids. He's not talking about their education and he doesn't care about the health and safety of anyone. Well, if I can just follow up, I mean, um, of course, that you know, you would be the first to say that there is a value to being, um, you know, in, in school and, and, and learning beyond the concerns about the economy, though I think that's a really interesting and important point. How do you balance that needs when you're thinking about the whole child? How do you say, well, there is this value that, you know, teachers and, and the American Academy of Pediatrics says we should get kids back to school. How do you balance those things when you're thinking about reopening? And I'll, I'll start with you, Lily, you have your, your finger and you're ready to go. <laughs> I am so ready to go. And, and he Here's the thing, the Academy of Pediatrics was appalled. They cherry picked out of that. Yeah. And they sent, th they, meaning the Trump administration, sent things to reporters saying, 
what a shocking thing. The Academy of Pediatrics says it's more important for those kids to be sitting with my 39 kids shoulder to shoulder. And they went, no, 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 read the whole report. It says you don't do something like that if it puts children at risk. It's when it's right, when it's the right time, when it's the right place, that the social emotional needs of those kids can't be ignored. And that them being out of school is, is, is um, costing something. So do it, but do it safely. And they later signed on to a letter that um, NEA uh, and our sister organization, the AFT, uh, signed on to. And it was administrators, teachers, and support staff and the Academy of Pediatrics saying, you do not sacrifice a child's life and help uh, for, uh, it, was, it was a false choice. And so I just wanna make that clear. And I want to make one more thing clear. All of these politicians who say, you know, like we can't go on like this forever. Oh Lord, I hope not, cause I can't, I don't think any of us can. I don't disagree with that at all. And so we have to rush in there and just do it, just do it. How hard could it be? Just get those kids in there. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll tinker around the edges as people start to what, die? Um, and here's what you will be doing if you don't do this right. Think Austin bars, all right? They opened those bars in Texas and Florida and Arizona and all those young people packed in there. They should have known better, but those were adult choices. They packed in there and what happened to the infection rate in the community? went up. So uh, my sixth grade was a germ factory on a good day. Kids blowing their noses and sneezing on you and you kind of get that. Now they cough on you and you end up in the ICU. So this is very serious. Just force it in there. Just open it, whatever. You turn it into the super spreader. That will be the new ground zero for the next spike. Then what happens to the economy? Yeah. We're we're taking steps backwards. You do it right or you hurt an entire community. Yeah. Chastin, I want to ask just from, uh, you know, to refer to personal experience in your new book, I have something to tell you. You write about your experience being a college student, a community college student living in your car. And then, of course, your journey to being where you are today. Um, but I'm just curious, you know, if you could speak to your experience, you know, as an at-risk student and some of the challenges that you had then which of course in a time like now would be compounded, how should uh, leaders be thinking about at-risk students like that and how to help them um, at a time when you know, school can be a lifeline in some ways? Well, it's very kind of you to plug the book, but I, I by no means um, went through what many of the students that I, I train under in, in Chicago public schools uh, and right here in South Bend public schools schools are going through. I mean, on the whole, I was extremely privileged when I was trying to access my education. In many places, some of the hardest hit school districts often fall on black and brown students. And in many of those communities, like we were talking about, there is a severe underfunding and under-resourcing uh, in those school districts. And I'm really worried about what families are going to do when they're looking for a way to make sure that they get back to work so they can provide for their children, provide for their families. And the only way they can do that is put their children at risk by sending them to school. There's already you know, a flight risk of, of teachers fleeing the profession. I don't wanna see teachers leaving the profession on gurneys. Neither do I wanna see children leaving school, spreading those uh, germs at home and, and creating that environment that Lily was talking about where, where it really turns into a hot spot for the community, all because this president and this secretary of education said, this is the way we get the economy back on track. For many families here in South Bend, that is just not an option. People need to support their families. They need to feed their families and they want to get back to work as well. And in many of those places that falls on extremely disadvantaged communities. One thing that we can also do right now, now, not only preparing to send our kids back to school safely, is also do what we can to elect Joe Biden president, because I think we also need a secretary of education who actually believes in public education. Because when I talk to my friends who are getting ready to go back into school, they're, you know, young 30-year-old teachers writing wills because they are terrified that they are going to get sick and they are going to die because they care so much about their kids. They are going to go back to school because they know that's where they belong. They know that's their calling. 
And I am so scared that I'm going to lose my friends to this virus because we teachers are trying to do the right thing while the government is not. This is a moment when so much of the way we do business is being rethought, the way that our economy works, all sorts of things. Um, and I'm just curious to you, Lily, is this an opportunity to rethink education? In which ways would you like to see that? You know, there, there, there are always opportunities in a crisis. And uh, this was no fun. Anybody that thinks that all those teachers that ran home uh, and, and in 24 hours had to figure out what they were doing with 32 kids in front of them now in 32 kitchens and figuring out what a, what a Zoom room was and all of these things, uh, it, it is not fun. We want our kids back. We want them back safely. But the kinds of things that I've been hearing, it's that they're saying, all right, uh, this whole thing where my district gave me some kind of scripted reading program or scripted this or that, that I never thought very creative and I never really liked, now I got to be a little more creative. We did more project-based learning. I started thinking what someone might have in their kitchen or interviewing a, a relative uh, that they couldn't meet with. They, they had to use new muscles to say, I don't have everything I had and maybe the stuff I had wasn't that good anyway. And so they started thinking, I'm gonna have my kids build something, interview somebody, write a report about something that interests them not about something because it was on some standardized test in a couple of months. And so they've actually said in some ways they're using their creativity in very, very exciting ways. And I hope that doesn't go away. I hope we don't go back to what things were because things were not equitable and things were still too scripted and we still didn't have the collaboration that, that all of a sudden, even on a Zoom call, uh, teachers are getting together. They're learning from each other. They're saying what worked, what didn't work. And it's a little bit different and a little bit better. It's a great note to end on. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to both of you. Very interesting and important discussion. Thanks for having us.